Why don't you stand with me if you're at home, put down your pizza. Why don't you take somebody's hand? If you don't know them, tell them who you are. You don't have to make a circle. Okay, if you've got their hand and they won't talk to you, turn loose. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you for the great honor we have of celebrating Easter. Lord, you've set us free to do that. And I thank you for that great liberty and freedom that we have that we can open our doors and open our campus and extend an invitation to friends and neighbors and family members. We praise you for that. Lord, I pray especially for the young people and the children that the joy that is represented in the redemptive work of Jesus would, that you would give them a revelation of that far beyond services or guests or music or sermons or crowds or people. Give them a revelation of yourself that will shape all the days ahead of them. We pray for the churches across our nation and throughout the earth that are preparing to celebrate or those who are in very difficult places where there's great oppression, I pray that you'll make a way. Send your angels to stand guard around them, Lord. May those who would do them harm fail in their plans and their attempts. Lord, for those who are simply distracted and, and, and asleep, I pray that you would awaken them to the wonderful gift that is ours in the redemptive work of Jesus, and that they would have a desire to celebrate that to lift their hearts and their hands and their voices in praise and thanksgiving to you. I praise you for it. Lord, from coast to coast and border to border, may the name of Jesus be exalted. Lord, on every continent, across the oceans, let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. May your name be lifted up. May your people be encouraged. May the darkness be pushed back. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. You may have a seat if you can stand it. You should have received an outline when you came in. If you're joining us online, you can download those from the apps or the websites. We've been working through a series and I want to continue it. It seemed appropriate to me to carry it through this weekend as we finish our preparations for Easter. It's Palm Sunday weekend when we celebrate Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. Folks, he's coming back. Amen. And you know, far too often if you talk to Christians, the, it seems like the kind of the prevailing attitude is that when Jesus returns, we'll go, oh, it's good to see you. But the presentation of Scripture is that he's stepping back into time because if he didn't, his people wouldn't survive. And it will be the most glorious, triumphant reunion that you will ever know. It will. And so I think understanding who we are in Christ, first and foremost in life, clarifying our identity. There is so much language around confusion these days around our identities. In fact, we're told, we're coached, we're given permission to be confused about it. You know, who you are in Christ is the most single important characteristic of your existence. Amen. Understanding what that means, what the implications are, what the benefits are, what the responsibilities are, is so, so important. And I, I regret the fact that in, in church world for too long, we have coached you towards other things. And at the center of who you are is who you are in Jesus. In this session, I want to talk to you specifically about being secure in an insecure world. Things are changing dramatically and rapidly, cataclysmically. And as desperately as some are trying to pretend as if that's not so, it is our reality. Now, I'm an optimist. I believe it will take us to some better opportunities for the kingdom. What it will mean for the routines of our lives is not clear to me. But I, I can tell you our futures are not secured by the routines of our lives. Our futures are secured by Almighty God Amen. and by our relationship with Jesus. And we will look at it in more detail, but I'm going to submit to you repeatedly that you, you don't have to be afraid. You don't have to be discouraged. 
but neither do I want you to be asleep. I think it's extraordinarily important that we be aware. The theater of the absurd that we have spoken about, I'm amazed at their ability to release new productions. <laughs> it's exhausting to me as someone who participates in the preparation of, of public services on a regular basis. We cannot keep up with the absurdity. It's simply bizarre, and you don't need me really to identify it, the propaganda that washes over us, the messaging that's intended to confuse or addle or misdirect is unrelenting. You can pick a topic. This week, they made a whole other bold step towards electric vehicles, and I'm not really opposed to them. I think they probably meet a niche in the market. But the idea that electric vehicles and our utilization of them in mass is going to resolve climate change. <laughs> it's not only absurd, it's just patently bad science. But the, the billions of dollars and the manipulation that are invested in pushing you in that way is just seemingly, it is shameless. The censorship is perhaps most disconcerting, particularly for the younger people among us. The limiting of free speech, you know, whether it's done through algorithms, through labels of misinformation or disinformation or malinformation, the words keep morphing a bit. It has become the norm. There's no question about it. It's not hidden. No one apologizes for it any longer. We used to imagine that the First Amendment was one of our most celebrated and protected rights. And in a very short order, we have seen that dismantled. It's all right, God's still on the throne. You don't have to be afraid. But we are afraid. We're afraid to use our voices. We're afraid to say anything. And that's not only tragic, it's unfortunate, and we will have to find the courage to change it. I would submit to you that good citizens should not be afraid of the government and the power they exercise. That is fundamentally wrong. And we are. And we understand that. Therefore, we're silent in many cases. We're afraid of the repercussions professionally, with the professional organizations that we're a part of, for our jobs, for the implications it will have for our children. And at the forefront of all of that is the church and our role in this. What should we do? What should we say? Well, I have said to you re repeatedly and will continue to, I believe the church is the conscience of the culture. Now, a brief review of history will tell you without great discernment that the church has not always been in the places we should have. We were late to the table with discussions about many things. Civil rights, the rights of women, the rights of children. I mean, we, we, we led those discussions. It was the moral authority that came from Scripture. But there was a great deal of suffering that came before God's people found their voices and the courage to use them. We have been strangely silent on the issue of abortion while 60 million children have been lost. And now we face a time when it's, it's political calculus that it's the pathway to power to promise people the right to kill their children. That is patently absurd. It's evil. It's not a political decision. And the church has an assignment. You know, just a brief glance at the current responses of the church would suggest to us in, in some rather uncomfortable ways that our consciences have been seared. Now, I believe the pathway back from that, beyond repentance, is understanding who we are in Christ and the authority in which we stand. The primary allegiance of our lives is to Jesus of Nazareth. We believe he's the Messiah. That's why we call him the Christ, the anointed one, the incarnate son of God. We have yielded to him as Lord of our lives. That is positional. It means he has first place. He establishes the priorities. He is our identity first and foremost. And then we serve him as king. But having established that, we're going to have to learn to live in that authority. That has not really been necessary for us. We've had enough freedoms and liberties and opportunities and abundance that, that we could kind of have a murky understanding of that and still find a way forward on many, for many of us. And I don't believe that will be true in the season that's before us. I believe we'll have to know who we are in Christ and what he's done for us and what the implications are for us regarding that. And I don't just mean your eternity. You know, I believe that to be a Christ follower means you'll spend eternity with God in his kingdom. 
But the purpose of Jesus' redemptive work on the cross, his death, burial, and resurrection, was not simply to give you a ticket to heaven. That is a diminished gospel. It's to enable us to be light and salt in this world. That has never been easy, and it will not be easy in the season ahead. The question is, will we have the courage and the determination to do that? So being secure in an insecure world starts by understanding the authority over your life. And it doesn't begin with governments or political parties or documents or the United Nations or passports. And I'm grateful for all of those things, but they're not the ultimate authority over our lives. We belong to Jesus. I've said to that to you repeatedly. I brought you a few more verses than we've looked at. This is not some subtle theme of Scripture. In 1 Corinthians 3, it says, you belong to Christ, and Christ belongs to God. You belong to Jesus. Now, that carries with it an implication. We have some responsibilities because we belong to him. We're not our own, the Bible says. It's not my time and my calendar and my money and my preferences. I belong to him. It's an appropriate question. What would you like for me to do? It's your time and your calendar. You've given me these days. How might I invest them on your behalf? It's equally true when there are threats and oppression and opposition. It's fair warning to anyone who would oppose you. I belong to the creator of heaven and earth. Proceed with caution. It's the story of scripture. 1 Corinthians 15. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. But each in his own turn, Christ the first fruits, then when he comes, those who belong to him. Again, you'll find this theme woven throughout Scripture, Old and New Testament. We belong to God. Jesus is coming back to the earth, not on a search and rescue mission for all humanity. He came that way one time, that whoever would believe in him could be saved. When he returns to the earth, he's coming back for those who belong to him. Amen. You want to have absolute clarity on that in your life. And not based upon the recitation of a prayer or the trip to an altar. Or even visiting the baptismal pool. But because you have yielded your life to the lordship of Jesus. Amen. You don't earn your way to heaven. Nonsense. It's impossible. The only way to do that is to keep the rules perfectly. And none of us can do We can't keep the rules driving to church perfectly <laughs> but having received the free gift of salvation the value we attach to that gift is how we choose to lead our lives Jesus is returning for those who belong to him that's a very important idea to tuck into your heart 2nd Corinthians chapter 10 <clears throat> there's bickering in the church in Corinth can you imagine that a church where there was actually bickering I know it's hard for you to believe but must have been a first century issue. Said so you're looking only on the surface of things. If anyone is confident that he belongs to Christ, he should consider again that we belong to Christ just as much as he. Again, it's the grounding idea that Paul is handing the church in Corinth to help diminish their quarreling. He said you belong to Jesus. It'll change everything if we can get that settled into our heart. No matter where we work, we walk into those places of employment as someone who belongs to Jesus. No matter where we go to school, we belong to Jesus. No matter which community we live in, no matter where we go with our discretionary time, we belong to Jesus. The Bible says we're Christ's ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us. So we've got this very destructive idea that has taken deep root amongst us and it's that, you know, you attend church on the weekend at the service of your choice, but then you live your life. And you kind of get your God business done, and you get it all bundled up and neatly aligned, and maybe even you learn a little theology around it, but your life is yours to live. That is not a biblical notion. We belong to him. Now, that doesn't seem to matter when things are stable and going in the direction you like. But if the stability were to unravel... And the pressures are to mount. You will want to know to whom you belong. Amen. I have been with too many persons and too many families in the midst of too many crises to tell you anything else. 
If you get a diagnosis that you never wanted to receive, the argument is not about which translation to read. If you get information that is overwhelming, you don't want to argue about which style of music you prefer. And we've had the luxury of introducing some ideas, while they're not unimportant, they're not of primary significance. Galatians chapter 3 and verse 29 says, If you belong to Christ, then you're Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. That's a marvelous verse of Scripture. If you belong to Christ, it's your choice. You are welcome in his kingdom. If you choose to acknowledge Jesus as Lord of your life, you can belong to Christ. It's different than sitting in church or being kind or polite or tame or cleaned up. If you truly belong to Christ. I have invited you to some things over these past two or three years. I've asked you to be more aware of the circumstances in the world, to watch, to listen, to think, and to act. I have encouraged you to read your Bible with a determination beyond any commitments you've ever had before because I don't believe that you can maintain your spiritual stability without a regular engagement with the Word of God. I want to add something because I believe the season has changed again. I want to ask you to begin to memorize the Scripture, Amen. to put it in your heart. I'll bring you a memory verse from time to time, not every service, but I will bring you a memory verse from time. You can choose your own if you prefer. But there is strength I have found in some of the things that we do collectively. There are many ways you can read your Bible. I'm not suggesting that our, our pattern of doing that is better than anyone else's. I'm simply telling you that there's a strength sometimes if we're reading the same things in the same rhythm. It gives you a conversation point when you're together with your groups or your family or with your children. Well, memorizing the Word of God, putting it in your heart so that it's available to you to your soul, to your emotions, and to your mind 24-7 without having access to digital technology to give it to you or to a printed book. Put the Word of God in your heart. Amen. And I want to offer you this verse as a beginning point for that, Galatians 3.29. It's not in terribly long. You're not too old to memorize things. You're not too young. You're not too busy. It has little to do with your reading ability. It has very little to do with your weight or the accent with which you speak or your preferred fashion choices. It has everything to do with your desire to put the Word of God within you. It is worth the discipline. Galatians 3.29, if you belong to Christ, then you're Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. I turned it to a proclamation. It's a little statement you can make over your life. When you get the verse tucked in your heart, take this proclamation with you. I belong to Christ. I'm Abraham's seed. And an heir according to the promise. I belong to Christ. I'm Abraham's seed. And I'm an heir according to that covenant that God made with Abram. If you don't know what that means, on your time, go read Deuteronomy 28, the first 12 verses. It's remarkable. I mean, you'd be willing to consider memorizing some scripture. That's a good start. Don't warn the people who are coming on Sunday. Let me catch them off guard, okay? <laughs> In all candor, I think we have to be prepared to walk through God's judgment. I don't believe we can continue to live as we're living and imagine that God will smile at us. I don't mean that as a threat. It appears to me that we're more afraid of the consequences of embracing the truth than we are the consequences of ignoring God's truth. We understand intuitively there's some consequences if we step into the culture and tell the truth about a biblical worldview. And we're more afraid of those consequences than we are God. If we hide from our assignment, we'll not be able to hide from God's response. So I believe we have to be prepared. Again, it's not a threat. It's a very prudent move. It's a part of preparation. Jesus prepared his friends for the judgment of Jerusalem. Jesus himself, on the ground, with his closest friends, said, the Romans are coming. And you need to be prepared. We need to understand where our security is. 
And if we imagine it's coming to our future and to our children's future from any place other than the person of Jesus Christ, I think we're incredibly vulnerable. Jesus prepared his friends for the hatred and antagonism which awaited them as they went forward as advocates for him. He told them, he said, you will be hated by all people because of me. Before he left, he said, you need a sword. Everybody's not going to give you a group hug. I'm not encouraging violence, folks. Don't, I can get in enough trouble without you misconstruing my words. <laughs> but I think it's improbable that the kind of stability that we have known defines our future. And we've got to be prepared, spiritually and emotionally. Jesus' best friends, they were not delivered out of hatred and persecution. Read the book of Acts. We've just completed it together. They faced challenges from the beginning to the conclusion. They were delivered through them. God will deliver us. He will take us through. Whatever, we don't have to be afraid. We don't have to be frightened. We don't have to be anxious. We can recognize that God is moving. At the end of the day, the name of Jesus will be lifted up. He's preparing a people for himself. We want to be a part of that. We should not imagine that our future will be like our past. Look in 1 Corinthians 6, 19. Do you not know? And whenever the Bible says that, our answer is no, probably not. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you've received from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price. So honor God with your body. It's not complicated stuff. Honor God with your body. Think of the messaging that cascades over us about how we look, how we appear, how we present ourselves, how we identify. The biblical direction is really clear. You're not your own. You've got an earth suit, but it's been bought and paid for. Honor God with it. Honor God with where you take it. Honor God with how you decorate it. Honor God with your body. You're not your own. You were bought at a price. Look at Romans 14. None of us lives to himself alone. None of us dies to himself alone. That's a challenge to the doctrine of, of personal salvation. Again, I believe in that, but we have a collective responsibility, a responsibility to be a part of the body of Christ, to love one another, to care for one another, to honor one another, to stand with one another. What unifies us is we stand under the lordship of Jesus. Not our nationality, not our hair color. Not all of the things that we stand unified in him. And there are powerful voices, powerful forces seeking to bring great division and animosity and hatred amongst the people of God. It is not the Holy Spirit. None of us lives to himself alone and none of us dies to himself alone. If we live, we live to the Lord. And if we die, we die to the Lord. We belong to him. So whether we live or die, we belong to the Lord. We belong to the Lord. Our security is anchored to the foundation of the one who saved us. We build our lives upon this security when we practice the truth that we know. Remember the parable Jesus told? It's not in your notes. Sorry. But it is in the book. <laughs> you can check me later. Jesus told this parable about men who built houses. Two men, they built two homes. They chose different locations. One chose beachside property. The view was amazing. But the foundation was on sand. And when the storms came, the house couldn't withstand the storms. Remember that? He said, the other person built it in Middle Tennessee. <laughs> oh, uh, no, no. In all fairness, what it really says is he built it on rock. <laughs> Sounds like Middle Tennessee to me. We've been building some roads around here. I'm telling you, we're long on rock. But what Jesus said by explanation was the rock was the person who heard the word of God and put it into practice. Amen. And the same storm that assaulted the beachfront property assaulted the home that was built on the rock. It's identical in description. But where the beachfront property collapsed, the house that was built on the rock withstood the storms. 
The one who hears my word, Jesus said, and does it is like a person who builds his house on the rock. We've had lots of studies and lots of discussions and lots of sermons, and I'm not opposed to any of those things, but your application of the truth you know is what will secure you in what is before us. It's not theoretical any longer. It is our reality. I want to encourage you, if you don't hear anything else, we don't have to be afraid and we don't have to be discouraged. Amen. We do not. You can live in frightening times and discouraging circumstances and be unafraid and not discouraged. Look in 2 Chronicles 20. It's a message that the God brought to the, to the people of Israel through one of the, the, the people given responsibility to minister to the people. If we call it a message from a prophet, I think somehow it, 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 it changes a context. It's a message God gave through one of the people that had been accepted the responsibility to minister to the people of God. One of the Levites from... Uh, he said, listen, King Jehoshaphat, Israel is facing an army that they are, is too powerful for them. They're greatly outnumbered and their technology is not adequate. Listen, King Jehoshaphat, and all who live in Judah and Jerusalem, this is what the Lord says to you. Do not be afraid or discouraged because of this vast army. Now, if the message comes, you, you know this principle well enough by now. If the message comes and says, do not be afraid and do not be discouraged, what is the prevailing sentiment? Fear and discouragement. So the message comes and says, do not be afraid and do not be discouraged because of this vast army. It acknowledges the problem. You're outnumbered. You're outgunned. They're more sophisticated and they're more numerous. There's nothing you can do. And the message that comes says, do not be afraid and do not be discouraged. Folks, we don't have to be the majority. Truth has an authority. And we want to be the people who live in God's truth. For the battle is not yours, but God's. The battle is not yours, but God's. So I gave you another proclamation. You just get lots of takeaways today. I didn't give you that passage as a memory verse. I didn't want to frighten you week one. We'll get some big old verses to learn, but let's start out here. With the proclamation, I'm not afraid, I'm not discouraged, the battle is not mine, it belongs to God. I wonder if we can say that together. I'm not afraid, I'm not discouraged, the battle is not mine, it belongs to God. We're going to do this together, all right? These two sections, I'm not afraid. You're not very loud either. I'll tell you what, why don't this section help them, okay? <laughs> On three, right? One, two, three. I'm not That's better. Oh no, not y'all. This these three. One, two, three. Now this group over here, we're not discouraged. Right? <laughs> On three, I don't have anybody else to put in here with you, so y'all don't have to be strong and courageous, okay? On three, one, two, three. Don't get ahead of me. Now, those of you in the stadium seats, you got a long one. But you're spread out all over the room, so you can do this. The battle is not mine. No, back here. Don't get ahead of me. If you're in the stadium seats, the battle is not mine. You with me? You got to be loud because you're so far away. On three, one, two, three. We're auditioning for the voices of Lee. <laughs> now let's see if we can do it, all right? You three know your line? Y'all help these people over here, okay? One, two, three. I'll find out when auditions are. I'll write you a reference. You need it tucked in your heart. 
Yes, we have passports. Yes, we pray for those in authority over us. Yes, we will participate in the process, but our future is secured by Almighty God. It is so important to understand that. We've been idolaters. We put so many things in front of that. So many descriptors, so many points of hope, so many things that we imagined would provide for us or care for us or take us through. And God in his mercy has begun to awaken us. Amen. Amen. I want to take, I'm not going to finish your outline. <laughs> but I will. I just may not do it in this session. We have to clear the room so we can reload. So I'd have to be done by like 4 a.m. So it's probably just not good. But, but I want to take a couple of minutes and at least open this next segment. In the book of Ephesians, there are multiple, dozens and dozens of statements about who we are in Christ, what it means to be in him or what's come to us through him or the attributes that fill our lives because we belong to him. And it's put in this remarkable context of the heavenly places, of what's happening in the heavens. And I think our language is a little bit limited in 1 Corinthians, I'm sorry, it's 2 Corinthians 12. It's not in your notes either. You got the cheap version. <laughs> Paul talked about a man who was caught up into the third heaven. Well, by logic, if there's a third heaven, there has to be a first and a second. So biblically, we can talk with clarity or at least with, with freedom about the multiple heavens. And I think it's in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1, it says, In the beginning, God created the heavens. The Hebrew word is plural. It has a plural ending on it, just like we would put an S on it in English. So from the very introduction of the Bible, we're, we're introduced to this idea that the heavens are presented to us as being more than a singular thing. Heavens is plural. Now, I can, I can explain it in the way that it's typically embraced by scholars. It's, it, there is some opinion in it, but it, it's at least an informed one. There's the heaven that's God's dwelling. There, there's really no question about that. In the book of Revelation, we're given several scenes of heaven, the throne room of God, and the place where the, the heavenly hosts dwell. Okay? Then we know there's the heavens that are above the earth. The Bible talks about the heavens where God put... It's the stars we can see and, and the heavens that we look up into. And then there's that mid-heaven. And the implication of Scripture seems to be that that mid-heaven is the seat of the authority for Satan and his kingdom. So when it talks about the heavens, we need a bit more context and information to know precisely what's being discussed. And I don't think it's really helpful to think of it in terms of a layer cake. Like, you know, there's one here, and there's one a little higher up, like the stratosphere and the, ion the ionosphere, and the I have a lot of fear. You know, it's not like that. <laughs> I think it's more helpful to think of it dimensionally. The place where God dwells, where his throne is, isn't just way far above the earth on which we stand. It's a different dimension. So these, these multiple heavens, it's an important idea. And in the book of Ephesians, we're invited into this discussion. In the first chapter, in verse 3, you do have this in your notes. It says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. It says, In the heavenly realms, in the place where the authority of God emanates from, we have been given every spiritual blessing because we attend WOC. <laughs> wow. We would have a crowd for Easter if that were true. But what it actually says is we have every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places because we are in Christ, because we belong to him. It's given us access to the authority of heaven. Wow! It goes on to give some amplification in verse 4. He chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. God chose you and me in Jesus. See, there is no explanation in Scripture for why God loves us. 
There's none offered any place that I'm aware of. It simply says that God did. The whole redemptive initiative, the incarnation, Jesus putting on an earth, site, earth suit and coming to the earth and offering himself as a sacrifice, exhausting the curse of sin that you and I in turn might have all the blessings of his perfect obedience. There's no explanation for that. Because from the beginning of Genesis to the conclusion of Revelation, we are a rebellious lot. We are stubborn and self-willed. We're idolatrous. We're immoral. We're very uncooperative. Does that sound right? I mean, if it doesn't describe you, it describes somebody you know. <laughs> and they think of you when they think of the description. <laughs> There's no explanation. But what the Bible tells us is that the, the redemptive work, of God did it because of Jesus. There's no redemptive plan for the angels. A third of the angels rebelled against God. They were created beings. There's no redemptive plan for them. God chose us in Jesus. You, you need to, that needs to become more a part of your thoughts and even your words. Lord, I thank you I belong to you. I thank you for that. I want to honor you today. How might I please you today? You see, we're, we're so oriented. It starts when we're young with what we want to do with establishing our own kingdom of self. How I feel and I think and what makes me happy and what's going to satisfy me and what's going to make me content and my dream and my plan and my life. And that grows in us and it becomes so strong and so powerful it almost overshadows this invitation to belong to Christ. And then we learn to hang religious words around it and religious activities around it and so we go to church or we go to a Bible study or we be polite and we learn vocabulary words we probably shouldn't use and, and then we kind of dress it up from the outside in but the real transformation is from the inside out. Lord, I belong to you today. What would you have me do? Well, I may have to go to work today. I may have assignments and responsibilities and appointments and places to be and things to do but in every one of those contexts I'm going on your behalf. Amen. What would that look like? Amen. And at the end of the day, Lord, I... I I don't think I got that all just right. I was quiet on a couple of points where I probably should have had a voice. And a couple of times I had some things to say and I'd probably been better to be quiet. Lord, I'm sorry. As I rest tonight, I want to awaken tomorrow and join you in your day. We belong to him. It's, it's really not helpful to think of this in terms only of eternity, folks. There are things in front of us, opportunities in front of us, challenges in front of us, where we're going to have to be prepared and willing and ready to say, I belong to him. Amen. And it probably will not be responded to with applause. He chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. The only shot we got to be in holy and blameless is in him. In love, he predestined us to be adopted as his sons through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will. To the praise of his glorious grace, which he's freely given us in the one he loves. His grace does not come to us arbitrarily. We don't receive the grace and the mercy of God because we're cute. I mean, we are, but that doesn't qualify us for grace. We qualify for grace and mercy because we're in him. If you don't belong to him, you shouldn't imagine you're going to receive grace and mercy. And if you're receiving grace and mercy, you better understand fully well why I belong to him. It'll help you with that tug of war. It'll help you sort it out. Verse 7, in him we have redemption. Through his blood. It's a little repetitive, have you noticed? In him we have redemption. Through his blood we have redemption. The forgiveness of sins through his blood in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding. And he made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ to be put into effect when the times will have reached their fulfillment to bring all things in heaven and on earth together under one head, even Christ. Where are we headed? What's our future look like? Well, it goes way past elections. 
and political parties and movements and ideologies and economic systems. Ultimately, we will stand together under the authority of the headship of Jesus of Nazareth. Amen. Let's start practicing. Verse 11, in him we were chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will. Paul lives in a world where most frequently when he presents the gospel of Jesus Christ, there's a riot. And what you do not hear is fear or discouragement or reluctance or hesitation or ambivalence or hesitancy. I pray that you and I will cooperate with the Spirit of God and day upon day and week upon week and month upon month be more completely transformed into the image of Jesus. That we will be unrelenting, unyielding advocates for Jesus of Nazareth. Amen. That whoever may know us, in whatever context they may know us, they will know us as men and women who belong to Jesus of Nazareth. Amen. We're works in progress. We'll have to help one another. We'll have to encourage one another because we leak. We do, but it's worthwhile. It's a worthwhile commitment. It will bear fruit for your journey through time, and it will be richly rewarded for all eternity. We're not afraid. We're not discouraged. We are heirs according to the promise. It's a wonderful future. I brought you a prayer. And we'll work on Ephesians. Why don't you stand with me? Can we say this prayer together? Almighty God, you're the creator and sustainer of all things. You establish rulers and you remove them. Forgive me for placing my trust in persons or institutions before you. I repent and acknowledge your authority over my life. Now awaken me to your plans and purposes. Grant me an understanding heart that I may take my place. Lord, look upon your people with mercy and raise up deliverance from every attack. May it please you to demonstrate your great power on behalf of those who cry out to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. God bless you.